Um, the title of freshwater zone is a very important hot spot that creates hot moments in the continuum and linkage between watersheds and the coast. So really what I'll be talking about is how that zone influences the delivery of material from watersheds to estuaries. And on the flip side, how does the ecosystem respond to those uh, regular events, but also those extreme events? Um, this is a very famous shot of the Mid-Atlantic right after Tropical Storm V in 2011, which is a, uh, the, a, the second largest storm of record for most river discharge stations around the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, a lot of intense rainfall fast created this very large sediment plume uh, that delivered a large amount of sediment and water and other contaminants and constituents into the Chesapeake Bay's tributaries and into the main stem of the bay. Um, ironically, this is also a very uh, contentious uh, image because it creates lots of misconceptions. Uh, nature satellite imagery, it's really just skimming the surface of a sediment plume that was not deep. It was just on the surface of the water. So it makes it look like a whole bunch of sediment got into the bay, perhaps repeating the largest flood event of record in the Chesapeake Bay, which is Hurricane Agnes, which has undisputable massive impacts on the watershed, uh, again, the biggest floods of record, and also created a huge state change in the Chesapeake Bay estuary that they're still trying to recover from. But this event uh, was not that meaningful, as it turns out, for the Mason of the Bay, but it does highlight the importance of watershed delivery to estuaries for sediment supply. And it's not just, I'm not just gonna talk about watershed delivery materials, but also talk about how extreme events uh, influence the formation of ghost forests, and not just the formation, but where some of the consequences for ecosystem functions, processes and carbon cycling and storage as salinization events creep upstream. Um, in the case of this work I'll be focusing on, uh, it's, augmented by sea level rise, but it's actually droughts that we're finding have the largest impacts on the rate of salinization and cause the biggest changes to the ecosystem. So we'll also be talking about extreme drought events. So first, just a little background on uh, what I'll be focusing on in the tidal freshwater zone. And those are tidal swamps, tidal, freshwater, forested wetlands. These are located at the most uh, upriver portions, right? immediately below the head of tide. Uh, they're very common uh, around the U.S. Atlantic and Gulf Coast. There are also examples in the U.S. Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's less knowledge or documentation of where they are around the world, but they're certainly important on the U.S. East and Southeast Coast for um, at that interface between watersheds and estuaries. Um, most people have more uh, recognition and understanding of tidal freshwater marshes than these tidal freshwater swamps. Tidal freshwater marshes tend to occur at slightly lower elevation along the same portion river, but also further downstream. Um, but most uh, maps and most documentation of the area of these systems, it's actually tidal freshwater swamps occupy more of the landscape than tidal freshwater marsh. Hence our focus on these tidal swamps. So where they occur in the landscape is at this <clears throat> continuum of different processes. The tidal freshwater zone is of course at the uh, interface of tidal and non-tidal hydrology, uh, river hydrology from freshwater to salinization, but also a changing geomorphic system where the active valley changes from being a floodplain dominated system to more of an open channel system. So as you move downstream, uh, we've been focusing on how processes change as you move from bottomland non-tidal hardwood into tidal swamps, the tidal swamps undergoing ghost forest formation and conversion, and down into Olympia Hanley marshes. So as I mentioned, these are relatively abundant systems, so they haven't received much focus and some work I did with our former postdocs, Scott Ninson, was an attempt to really just quantify the extent of these systems, on this case on the Atlantic coast, and using published estimates of the length of these tidal freshwater rivers, uh, we computed that there's cumulatively around 3,000 kilometers of these systems over hundreds of different systems up and down the coast. So these are a very common landscape um, at that bottleneck at the head of tide. Uh, through the USGS Climate R&D Program, uh, Ken Krauss and I have been able to set up a network of sites across the uh, mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic. And we've been presenting some of our data from there that focuses on the importance of sediment delivery and trapping in the zone and its consequences for carbon storage and cycling. <clears throat> 
Uh, so we have sites around the Chesapeake Bay and also sites in South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, all of these sites span this landscape gradient from non-tidal to below the head of tide, uh, downriver through the tidal freshwater zone, through ghost forest formation, and into like a hailing marsh. So one thing we found is that when measuring sedimentation rates in these uh, tidal or non-tidal floodplain-based flood wetland systems along these rivers, uh, in this case, this data is presenting cesium or uh, lead dating of uh, sedimentation via cores. One thing we found consistently is that although there's a lot of variability, basically along each river, we're finding a minima of sedimentation in the lower tidal freshwater zone. So non-tidal, there's a moderate level of uh, sediment trapping in these wetlands. Um, as you go towards just below the head of tide, a little bit of variability, but again, generally along the rivers, there's a minima in that lower tidal freshwater zone. As you start to experience salt, you're getting towards the estuarine turbidity maximum, also along these estuarine rivers. And generally, sedimentation rates increase further downstream. However, this is where I want to bring in some extreme events. Um, in this case, uh, we had artificial marker horizons out at a network of uh, locations within our sites. And we just happened to have the second largest storm of record on the Chop Tank River on the coastal plain of Maryland during the study. Um, quirk of where the rainfall was, there really wasn't that big of a storm or flood event on the relatively nearby Pokemon River. So you can see that immediately downstream from the head of tide, uh, after this large flood event, massive amounts of sedimentation in the tidal freshwater uh, wetlands. But that that rapidly, that signal moving downstream rapidly diminished back to relatively background rates, uh, regardless of the storm on the Chop Tank River. So uh, extreme events do provide a huge sediment subsidy of sediment. That in itself is not too surprising. What we were really surprised about was just how far downstream it did not go. That sediment load was quickly trapped out um, near the head of tide. Um, likewise, um, if you measure the carbon content of that sediment, um, you can also you know, measure geomorphic processes contributing to carbon balance. So this is the carbon sedimentation rate over short-term marker horizon deployments. And again, in the lower tidal freshwater zone, there's a minimum, less carbon trapping um, at that portion of the landscape, more upstream, more downstream, least in the middle, over multiple rivers, <clears throat> except that extreme event on the Chop Tank River proves that big outlier near the head of tide with very large amounts, kilogram of carbon per meter squared per year being deposited um, over a short time horizon. Does that persist over the long term? Um, or is this really a short term extreme event based event that uh, eventually gets dispersed or eroded or uh, mineralized or otherwise just um, subsumed by long term patterns? So here we're comparing long term carbon sequestration sediments using either different techniques over different rivers. Uh, most of these rivers are cesium or lead dating. Um, the Metapenite Monkey Rivers are millennial scale carbon 14 based measurements. And what we're finding over the long term is, is slightly and subtly, but there's an important difference about where in the landscape most carbon is being deposited. So now um, in the lower tidal freshwater zone, where we're finding the lowest rates of contemporary carbon deposition, um, now it's a little bit elevated there, but again, the highest rates are just below the head of tide. Um, and that's true on most of the rivers. We're still uh, analyzing our course from the Mattapani Monkey in Virginia to really fill out the whole landscape gradient, but we're finding this general pattern that for carbon sequestration, again, this is different than just mineral sediment deposition, um, we're finding the greatest rates near the head of tide. Now, of course, that carbon can be coming from multiple sources. These are floodplain wetlands that are very effective at trapping a lot of this material. And certainly there are gradients from channel to interior back swap for how much of that uh, deposit materials are locked in this versus autochthonous, and it changes as you move downstream. So how much of this is actually autochthonous sources versus allochthonous material? Of course, we all know that has huge implications for, for modeling and understanding fate. But on a separate study along the Monkey and Mattapani rivers, uh, Alicia Coral, a PhD student, measured soil carbon turnover rates um, at these sites along the same landscape gradients. And the lowest rates of turnover, in other words, 
highest rates of preservation of existing carbon pools in the soils were lowest in the tidal freshwater zone. Um, very wet, but ideal tidal cycle, so it's wet dry cycling all the time, but the soil stay fairly wet. These are surficial sediments, but nonetheless, uh, very high rates of preservation. So we think it's a combination. Other studies in our, other parts of the country we've used uh, statewide scopes to differentiate allochnus versus autochnus, but clearly we're getting both here. Autochnus carbon has a very high rate of preservation than these tidal freshwater wetlands. They're also very effective at trapping that allochnus watershed derived terrigenous carbon being deposited as sedimentation. One thing I really like to focus on on this work is I work with a great team of geomorphologists who have really uh, educated me on long-term process. And particularly in the mid-Atlantic of the United States, most tidal freshwater wetlands formed as a result of European colonization. Poor soil uh, management practices in the uplands of the watersheds led to massive pulses of mineral sediment being delivered over the past hundreds of years. Um, so a lot of what we're measuring now is really an artifact of that anthropogenic modification of the landscape. Now that's not true everywhere. There were tidal freshwater wetlands before Europeans came here, but what has happened almost everywhere is that there's now an ele elevation capital that was subsidized by those past hundred years of legacy sediment. And now as these tidal freshwater systems are experiencing accelerated sea level rise, um, what we're, they're experiencing is very much an artifact of that subsidy over the past centuries. Um, so for example, this is a plot of sediment deposition rates in meters per year over time relative to the present. And you can see the post-European colonization pulse in actually two separate pulses over the modern history. So what were water systems look like now and how they're changing the future, I argue, requires this long-term geomorphic perspective on why these systems are there in the first place. They're located in depositional environments. Um, and in the past, they've trapped a lot of sediment, but now that sediment supply has been greatly reduced. Sometimes intentionally through best management practices, they're intended to reduce uh, suspended sediment load reductions to restore estuaries, sometimes unintentionally through damming, for example. So to conceptualize what we've been finding most places is we're finding minimal sediment availability um, in the tidal freshwater zone. Watershed sediment gets trapped both in non-tidal floodplains above the head of tide and bottomland hardwood systems and near the head of tide. So that by the time you get to the lower tidal freshwater river, there's minimal sediment availability. Today I've been presenting on rates of sediment deposition in wetlands along rivers. We're finding the same thing for in-channel suspended sediment concentrations. So it's not just an artifact of looking at wetland deposition rates. And then as you move downstream into the Ligahaline reaches, uh, the estuarine turbidity maximum is supplying a much higher rate of in-channel suspended sediment load that results in higher Ligahaline wetland accretion. So there's this minima in the middle, the sediment shadow as we call it, that could have very important implications for the resilience of these systems to sea level rise and their ability to modulate watershed loads of sediment, nutrients, as well as carbon downstream of the estuaries. The sediment shadow phenomenon has been identified in lots of different rivers up and down the Atlantic coast uh, from us and from other people, but it's not universal. So uh, very quickly, we just decided we'd use the opportunity of the Chesapeake Bay program, which has an amazing data collection network around the Chesapeake Bay through the states of Virginia and Maryland primarily. And then to analyze uh, suspended sed sediment concentrations in estuarine waters to compare them to upstream river concentrations. So this is a graph of mean, each dot is a different sampling station around the Chesapeake Bay. And this is the mean of TSS versus uh, mean salinity for that station. And there's some very obvious patterns. There's a, there's a peak in the Lake Haling zone associated with the ETM. Interestingly, the tidal freshwater zone has a huge amount of spatial variability. So we thought we, we could use this as an opportunity to really evaluate the universality of the sediment shadow and explain the spatial variability. So if you look along individual rivers, there are three different patterns around the Chesapeake. And again, we expect across other regions of the country too. 
There's places that have the sediment shadow, which is the top panel. Higher watershed sediment compared to the total fresh water zone. Then you get that peak in the oligohaline uh, zone that then decreases to the mesohaline zone. Uh, the second in yellow is basically no change from watershed to the total fresh water zone. And the bottom panel is an increase from non-tidal into the tidal fresh water zone into the oligohaline zone. And then the map on the right shows uh, the locations of those different kinds of system behaviors. So you can see the sediment shadow, the downward blue arrow, is not everywhere. And the general pattern is that where it does occur is generally where there's higher watershed sediment delivery. So areas where there's a larger portion of the watershed coming from the Piedmont, where there's higher rates of natural sediment erosion as well as human-based sediment erosion, creates the opportunity for that sediment shadow. Whereas on the coastal plain, more typically historically black water systems with lower sediment supply, uh, we're not finding the sediment shadow. So we think we can start to identify and, and conceptualize where in the landscape you're more likely to get sediment delivery and that carbon delivery past that gauntlet of the total freshwater zone. Okay, now I'm gonna switch uh, for a little bit about talking about the salinization process and the influence of drought. So we've had uh, sites along the Waccamaw River and Savannah River in South Carolina, Georgia, located along the uh, boundary of where those forests are forming. And that's along what we call these lower sites. Um, and so we've been measuring carbon standing stocks on the top two panels, as well as carbon fluxes to answer the question of, does this whole scale conversion from a forested system to a non-forested system result in drastic changes in carbon balance? What we see with our eyes is a huge amount of change in the physiognomy of the system. The trees are dying. But what we're also finding is that marsh is coming in rapidly. A lot of those uh, herbaceous marsh species were already there in the understory. So as salinization happened, uh, they're primed to take, to take advantage of the opening of the tree canopy. Along both of these rivers, uh, we're finding that most of the tree death associated with salinization occurs not with tropical cyclones, uh, not with sea level rising, but rather based upon watershed droughts. And so we uh, initiated these sites, and particularly along the Savannah River, within three years, we had 75% tree mortality, which corresponded to a very intense drought uh, about a decade ago. So we're measuring big changes in above ground storage of carbon as the trees die and convert to marsh. That's not too surprising. Right, you're changing from trees to herbaceous marsh vegetation. But if you look below, below ground, uh, we're switching from an above ground carbon-based system, or at least a balance, to a, a lot more carbon storage below ground. Now, this is a space for time substitution as well. So this is not an instantaneous process, but we are finding that across the landscape transgression, um, the whole, total amount of carbon storage is not really changing. It's just changing locations. Likewise, for Carbon fluxes, we're getting a lot more a lot of change from litter fall deposition towards primary production of herbaceous plant material. But total system dynamics, I would argue, are not that different. Again, the trees are dying. That has impacts for habitat, that has impacts for other things. But what we're finding is a lush marsh coming in as it converts from freshwater to a lake of alien. We also are going to take this data and convert it into a carbon budget. And um, a little hard to see the details there, but again, not that substantial of a difference in these total fluxes. And in fact, we're finding greater rates of carbon sequestration, as I showed in some of the previous graphs, higher rates in the oligohaline marsh than in these salt stressed tidal freshwater forests. So, one thing we think is happening is an interesting feedback. Uh, we've documented on the left, that as herbaceous production increases as the tree canopy dies, we're getting higher rates of sediment accretion on these marsh plant forms. Um, now, what's cause and effect? We think it's a complicated feedback. There's a much higher frontal area in the water column when you switch the marsh from a tree canopy, leading to greater rates of sediment deposition. But we're also finding, as shown on the right, that with greater amounts of sedimentation, we're also increasing in situ nitrogen and phosphorus mineralization of these soils. So we're subsidizing nutrients into the system as it's dying 
phaser dying at least, and converting to marsh, which is probably fueling greater rates of marsh plant produ production. So strong feedbacks occurring, which can make it hard to predict. But fundamentally, as I mentioned, history really matters. So I want to come back to um, what these systems have looked like in the past. Um, this is an example of a pollen diagram uh, taken from a deep core that my collaborator, Miriam Jones, has worked up from one of our Mattapanai sites. This is where the ghost forest is forming along the Mattapanai River. Um, but looking back through past time, going back a couple thousand years, this system to the deepest we could core of the Russian peak core started out as a tidal marsh, tidal freshwater marsh. And then around 400 AD, for reasons we're not sure yet, but it might be natural climate variability, it converted to a tidal freshwater swamp. And now it's converting back to marsh as the trees die. So on the landscape, these systems are inherently variable across time, but we may not have good uh, historic records without this kind of paleo reconstruction to know what was there in the past to better inform what the future might look like. So again, I just want to emphasize these are variable systems over time. What you see now probably was not there in the past. Again, to state the obvious, sediment availability uh, is critical for tidal wetlands, as we all know. Uh, it's highly predictive of their accretion rates and the ability to keep up with sea level rise. So sediment's not just important for carbon delivery and carbon trapping, it also sets up feedbacks with the resilience of these systems to sea level rise, which can then generate further changes in carbon cycling. And the recommendation I have is that we know that sediment behaves differently than dissolved constituents. So particularly for organic carbon, you would expect to have different behavior than dissolved organic carbon. I think this is particularly important for considering extreme events. Now, this is not a universal truth, but most of the places, most of the time, most sediment is transported, most of the sediment load in a river is transported over a very short period of time, making it more sensitive to extreme events because it's really the highest discharges, the highest velocities that entrain the material and deliver it to the coastal zone versus dissolved constituents, which um, are more spread out over time. So sediment, we, we think, we'd recommend is a very important both direct regulator of carbon dynamics, as well as a good proxy for understanding other processes. Extreme floods drive long-term trend as well as short-term trend, as well as anthropogenic influences on the landscape. Likewise, drought influences episodic salinization, as well as sea level rise influencing salt delivery that can also drive important carbon changes, but Perhaps a lot of those carbon changes might be less important, at least from a quantitative perspective, than our eyes see. As the coastal landscape changes, um, clearly we need more and better data that actually quantify these rates because um, the drastic changes we're seeing from ghost forests and all the public attention they're getting is important. It's showing rapid changes, but we need better data to really understand the impact on carbon cycling. And with that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Questions for Greg for five minutes or so. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Hi. Hi, I'm Lynn Moyardi, and I'm from the University of Colorado. Um, and so I enjoyed your talk. One of the questions I have is when I think about marshes or like estuaries, the back bear estuaries, I think of erosion of one marsh. Um, that sediment being supplied for other marshes. And so I was curious, you know, with these um, marshes that are experiencing less exposition and probably more erosion um, in the tidal freshwater, do you have any idea of where that sediment is going? It seems like it couldn't go upstream, it's probably like downstream for say in the TM. Um, and comment on the um, implications for other marshes around that area. Yeah, that's really important. Um, in the tidal freshwater zone, uh, what we've been finding is that there's relatively small erosion rates, lateral erosion, in other words. The river plan form is fairly fixed. And clearly, as you move downstream, the channel is widening. So over time, there has been and probably will be greater rates of erosion that will be occurring. But along these rivers, there's usually not much fetch. Um, it's a floodplain dominated system relative to channel width. So um, 
net balance, we think they are still net depositional, even though the deposition rates are low. But clearly, that can and will change over time. Um, further downstream, absolutely, uh, lateral erosion of tidal marshes is a um, dominant process. Um, the fate of that material, that we all know, needs better constraining. A lot of it does, does get redeposited locally. You know, for sediment, sediments are really sticky in the landscape most of the time. So we really focus on these giant plumes from hurricanes, and that can transport a lot of material. But oftentimes, it actually doesn't move that far, and the sediment has kind of very long sediment residence times in the landscape. We're talking about this at lunch. Um, there aren't great estimates, but for a lot of non-tidal floodplains, um, the storage time of sediment in the floodplain can be centuries to millennia before it ever gets an individual particle moves again. Now, it can move far when it's eroded, but then it finds another depositional zone, and it can sit there for centuries. So without that lateral erosion, which can accelerate that process, these, the sediment probably will stay there for a while. Correct. The old layer of So your sediment accumulation gradient is absolutely fast. It's doing this too. Um, and it kind of makes you start thinking, what are the like, what are the anaerobic microbial ecosystems going on? For instance, has anyone looked at the phagogenesis across those gradients to see if there's any variable? We are my collaborators and I are starting. We don't have a lot of data, um, but uh, there's a little bit. And one interesting aspect about methane in these tidal freshwater forests is given their position along the salinity gradient, they have much lower rates of flux than you'd expect for an equivalent system at that salinity zone. It may be that it's because the tidal freshwater swamps are typically 10 to 20 centimeters higher in elevation than tidal freshwater marsh. For example, it could be that there's just enough methanotrophy going on that the flux to the atmosphere is, is lower than expected. Or it could be carbon quality as you change from a forest with relatively refracting material to highly juicy herbaceous plant material. But the methane is actually surprisingly low, which helps for blue carbon, helps for carbon sequestration. But there's not a lot of data, unfortunately, on methane. Um, so We've looked at some redox dynamics. Um, it, it does fluctuate a lot until you get to be about below 10 centimeters and these days are reliably toxic. Thank you, Greg, yeah. for your question. We'll have more time for questions um, after our next speaker. Thank you. All right. We're going to move from deep time to deep space, so to speak. Um, not quite. But our next speaker is David Lagmasino, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Coastal Studies at uh, East Carolina University. Um, David's a uh, proud alum of Florida International University. I could have mentioned that Greg did his postdoc at FIU, so there's a lot at FIU. Um, yeah, go FIU. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, um, after FIU, David went up to NASA and did a lot of really cool work um, with Lola Tarayimbo and others. And he's continued in this vein and is going to present a lot of um, large scale, high resolution information on pixelated ecosystem state changes and what means what that means for the loss and recovery of wetland carbon. So uh, before he gets up here, we have an announcement. I have to fix the Zoom. All right, well, thank you again for uh, the invitation to come out to speak today. Um, as you can see, I brought a pixelated image. Uh, what you're looking at is South Florida, the Everglades. Uh, it's a time series going from 2000 to 2020. Um, a couple of hurricanes that happened over this timeline. Um, so you're looking at, as it goes through time, uh, both Katrina and Wilma passing in, in 2005 and that really sort of dark transition that you see there is Hurricane Irma uh, in 2017. And so much of what I'll be talking about today is those cyclones that are happening not only in South Florida, but across the Caribbean and sort of the impacts that we're kind of seeing and measuring from this pixelated approach, right? These kind of satellites that we're using for space. 
My name is on here, but please know that this is many, many researchers from NASA, from Yale, from FIU, from all over that are contributing to a lot of this work. And so just recently, we, we kind of went through this review of using remote sensing. Um, this is really focused on, on wet carbon ecosystems. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about those in situ measurements, those are going to be the best kind of most accurate kind of information that we're going to get, but they're not everywhere. And so that remote sensing, that satellite data that we get, right, we can really scale up those processes. Yes, it does introduce uncertainty, right, but we get to see a more uh, spatial uh, representation of that landscape. Um, but also we can go back in time and we can actually look at, in some cases, some satellites going back 50 years. And so as we go from that, um, that in situ, that site, that individual plot and scaling up to airborne and spaceborne data sets, yes, we're bringing in uncertainty. Um, but again, we're bringing in other parts that we don't get from those in situ measurements. And so since 2010, uh, there's been a, a sort of uh, substantial increase in the studies of wet carbon, that's that WC, monitoring with remote sensing. Um, and so this comes from, again, from our review paper that just came out recently. Um, and much of this is because of the interest in using remote sensing for land cover and land use changes, um, identifying priority areas for protection, uh, as well as kind of making these me uh, methods for measuring carbon uh, carbon stocks within the sediments, as well as within the above ground biomass. Part of this too, that increase since 2010 is the freely available and open uh, availability of Landsat imagery, which was kind of the major thing underlying many of these wet carbon uh, ecosystems. So there's a lot of these satellites that are measuring um, all different aspects of stuff on the landscape, stuff in the atmosphere, um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about some of those um, particular satellites and how we can actually use that to not only distinguish where loss is happening, when loss is happening, but kind of even attribute why that loss is particularly happening. So these satellites can really see what and where we cannot see, right? So we are going out to our sites, we go out to our individual plots, maybe we have a handful of those, right? But those are only representative of a few pixels within this entire landscape, as you kind of see in, uh, on the right-hand side in a uh, Landsat image of South Florida. And so what we're also pulling from this is other different spectral information that we can't see with our eye, right? And we're able to sort of identify these different characteristics of vegetation health, uh, of, of sort of flood characteristics. We can actually start to use that combined with this time series information to get a more dynamic landscape uh, of coastal processes. And what I mentioned earlier, we can look at nearly 50 years of this, right? So we just kind of had a, a, our anniversary for Landsat and, and had 50 years of this satellite that has been in orbit uh, since the early 1970s. And so we can use this information and with new sets of algorithms can actually start to clean up that and actually get a much more dense time series than even what we could do back just five, six, seven, eight years ago. And so what I'm gonna be talking a lot about today are these magnificent mangrove forests. Um, so these are uh, environments that I like to go into, um, but what you're seeing here is a sort of unique structure. So here you're looking at some of the tallest mangrove forests in the world. These are about 60 meters tall. Uh, they are found in uh, Gabon, West Africa. I don't really have a scale here, but some of the, the prop roots in this thing are about 10 or 15 feet above your head. Um, so these are massive forests that we see um, out in areas uh, of West Africa and in Colombia. But contrast those to the scrub forest, right? In the Yucatan Peninsula, we have these much more uh, scrubby forests that are no taller than right, my waist. And so there are these unique structures of that ecosystem that we can't necessarily see from all satellites. But recently, uh, there are now a lot of new satellites for that. ISAT-2, Tandem-X, JEDI, 
these are all things that actually measure that elevation uh, and canopy heights and structure, the vertical structure of these ecosystems. Um, and so we're really using this kind of information to identify that height that directly translates to above ground biomass, carbon, but we're also pulling out unique characteristics of that landscape. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we can actually start to look at elevation and drive and identify the geomorphic context of which these, uh, these coastal ecosystems uh, work in. And so we've been working a lot with these, these different um, sensors and satellites to really understand our uncertainty in it, right? So depending on the sensor, depending on the type of information, the data that's going into it from those in-situ measurements, there can be a lot of uncertainty. And so we're trying to make sure we reduce that so when a product comes out, people aren't uh, necessarily um, confused or, or uh, even upset about some of the things, right? We can actually classify that uncertainty that goes within these biomass and carbon measurements. And so we can use this satellite information using a, a true color composite map, these different extents of habitat and use that long-term uh, data set to look at change over time, identify places of gain and loss. We can use those other types of satellites in terms of tandem X to get at a canopy height, and this directly um, correlates with above ground biomass and carbon within these different ecosystems. And so one of the things that we got out from this is we were able to map the distribution of canopy height within these ecosystems across the entire world. Um, and what we were able to really find out with that and how it kind of relates to what we're talking about today is that distribution of mangrove structure, that vertical structure, is directly correlated with precipitation, with temperature, and in particular, tropical cyclones. And what I really want to point you to is if you look at the Americas, the African Indian Ocean, and the Asia Pacific, that gray bar that's kind of highlighted there, that's the frequency of tropical cyclones. And so what we're seeing within those locations is actually a, uh, a shift towards shorter canopy heights, shorter trees, less biomass, less carbon. And so what we're seeing is this, this relationship with that frequency of storms. And so what I like kind of say is we're getting a haircut every time these kind of cyclones come in. So the more frequent we get that haircut, the shorter our hair is going to be. And so what we're, we're seeing that across these different ecosystems. But one of the challenges here is how can we separate these disturbances from humans? Right? Here, uh, a spot in Tanzania that's about to be converted to uh, a rice farm. And how do we separate that from a more natural disturbance? This is in, um, in the Florida Keys. This is two and a half years after Hurricane Irma hit in 2017. So we have these two different disturbances that from a cyclone perspective or from a, a satellite perspective look very similar. And so how can we sort of tease these different things out? And so that was one of the things we set out to do um, was really identify not only the loss and where that loss was happening, but really why. Um, because this why directly relates to what's happening to the soil, what's happening to the vegetation, and what's happening to the carbon in those different ecosystems. And so one of the things that we're able to do is actually tease out that loss, but identify it as erosion. Uh, shoreline erosion was at a conversion to commodity. Um, was it related to extreme weather events, much like cyclones? Um, was it related to... Um, hydrologic disconnectivity and this non-productive conversion, um, and this idea of coastal squeeze, where you have both commodities and shoreline erosion happening together. And so we're able to put this attribute, and this was kind of an important step forward um, in monitoring some of the, the carbon emissions that come out from this. It's not just to say that it was loss, and we say, oh, 100% loss of carbon, all of that's going into the atmosphere. No, we kind of use this information about that context of those different types of loss and actually got to model that in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, and what we were kind of seeing is, you know, a lot of it was driven by humans. Most of the, there's six regions that accounted for 90% of the total potential 
CO2 emissions. Um, much of that within Southeast Asia driven by, as you can see in the green, agriculture and aquaculture conversion. But what I'll point you to is the tropical Northwest Atlantic, where we see more sort of attribution to uh, erosion and climatic events. And in particular for North America, um, we have this high frequency of hurricanes that have caused a lot of the loss within the region. Um, so yes, 60% globally is driven by humans, right? but within North, North America, it's about 50-50% related to extreme weather events and shoreline erosion. And so you've maybe, maybe seen this, this recent uh, paper that came out where mangroves are quite resilient to tropical storms or, or tropical cyclones. And so as we go from close to shore to away from shore and just and getting further inland, um, particularly for the Everglades, we have this fertilization that happens. Right? So we get this storm surge that comes in. It's bringing in uh, phosphorus-rich sediment. Um, and that's being deposited. And as you go further inland, that subsidy from that sediment decreases. And so this is actually a powerful sort of fertilizer um, to help restart um, regeneration after that storm, right? So you have a strong tropical cyclone that comes in, it can do devastating damage, but you get this sort of fertilization that can happen. But one of the things as well is in other spots, you actually have delayed mortality that can set in. And this can be nine months plus after a storm and actually can affect more of those uh, more mature and larger trees. In particular, I want to point you toward uh, that sort of additional mortality that happens. Part of this can be related to storm surge and the sediment that comes in where it's actually too much sediment. It can smother those roots. Um, sometimes it's just too much stress from flooding and I'll get in a little bit of that. Um, but yes, it's a fertilizer. The, sorry, the cyclones can bring in sediment that can be a fertilizer, but can also lead to these drastic die-offs. And so yes, cyclones can do some major damage. This was taken just a few months after Hurricane Irma in 2017. We went out to do a number of surveys. You can see impacts to the canopy, trees falling over, and we have a number of field sites out there that are looking at you know, what's happening to the forest now. But actually one of my weirdly favorite sites now in the Everglades is this spot um, in Flamingo. And so here you're looking at about two and a half years after Hurricane Irma, Four and a half years, slightly different location, but still representative for the region. Um, so this was four and a half years. Uh, this was just back in, in March. Uh, and we were just there last week and now looking at five years after. And so we're actually able to look at um, and understand this recovery. Of, I say that the death of that forest and what's happening to carbon in that forest. But then also, finally, after five years, we're starting to see some regreening, um, but when we kind of think about that frequency of cyclones, what might happen if we get another one, which South Florida just dodged, it depends on what part of South Florida you're talking about, um, just dodged uh, Hurricane Ian. And so I think in part of here and what my research interests are, um, we have something on the left, right? We think of this, Seesaw, right? We have this disturbance, it's coming back, right? We have this, this impact to, to, to carbon and how it, it regenerates after that. But then on the right, what happens to that seesaw when it completely breaks, right? And so I will add to this is not only is this just a funny gift that I found, but if you actually see, there's a guy kind of pulling it down at the end, right? So thinking about, right, that human interaction that might be exacerbating a lot of this, uh, this impact to the region. So that's where my interest kind of followed here 
And so we can use this satellite information and that time series um, to look at this change over time. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is time on the x-axis and essentially how green the forest is, a, a satellite metric that we use. And you can see these ups and downs. And so these ups and downs are related to cyclones within the Everglades. But on the left, you see that impact and that recovery. So we can start to measure that sort of impact, the, the resistance impact and how fast it bounces back. Right? But then on the right-hand side, you see this impact and these kind of state changes along the way. And so what we're able to do from this is then separate out these different characteristics to say whether it's a healthy forest, a degraded forest, one that's regenerating, or one that completely dies off. And so this led us to, to do, um, um, did this uh, analysis for Hurricane Irma in South Florida, and what we found was about 10,000 hectares um, died off after the storm. Um, and a lot of this was driven by its elevation, right? Lower elevation, its impact on storm and the storm surge that was brought in. But many of these regions are actually basins, endorque basins where water gets in, it doesn't have that connection to the tide and it just sits there. Um, and so that's what we're really kind of identified here and what led to this, this huge die off that we had. We were just there last week um, those forests are really still dead. And so what we can expand from this is to see these lateral changes. Um, and we can see degradation of shoreline erosion, or whether that's dieback, um, but also on the gain side, that landward expansion, that stuff that's recovered, or if it's new island in terms of uh, in Florida Bay. And what we've been doing there within South Florida is, is we've been flying a number of NASA instruments out there and looking at canopy height changes. Again, these are those direct relationships with, with above ground biomass. Um, and what we're seeing, you know, just a few years later is that not much has changed in, in the forest after Hurricane Arm. Um, and so this structure takes a lot of time, particularly after such a dramatic storm that we saw from, uh, from Irma. And what we identified here is when we look at, this is the sort of canopy density measurements over the entire uh, South Florida and look at canopy pipes. Um, there are these resistance and resilience um, characteristics across these different forests. And that relates to that canopy structure, that habitat structure, I put here. Um, so we can identify just by aspects of canopy height, of elevation, of species, where things will be most vulnerable to die off in the future. And so one of the things that we're looking at is now this time series. We talk about this, you know, talked about sort of the, the recurrence interval of, of cyclones. And when we look at across the Caribbean as a whole, um, what you're seeing here is the area of these coastal wetlands that are impacted uh, over time. And so not only are we having kind of this, these impacts from, from cyclones, we're seeing an increase within those coastal areas. And so what does this mean in terms of that recurrence interval uh, and, and the impact of those areas that are damaged? How long is it going to take them to, to recover as well? And so all of this is kind of going into these, these um, land ecosystem models, and we're bringing in that land cover uh, to include land management practices to look at these century scale trends in carbon export. But I want to emphasize too that it's not just CO2 and DOC that we need to think about. And so uh, a relatively new paper by uh, Judith and colleagues, um, when we think of methane, right, half of that uh, global methane is really coming from these aquatic um, ecosystems. We also need to kind of think about, well, what's that relationship again with, with methane? And so to help address this, we're actually funded through a NASA carbon monitoring system program uh, or project uh, to do kind of exactly that for this region. And so we were just out there last week 
Um, we have a full team of folks that are flying a, uh, an eddy covariance tower on a plane. We have folks that are on the ground measuring greenhouse gases, both CO2 and methane. We have our folks in the water that are also measuring um, fluxes of DOC, POC, DIC, as well as greenhouse gases. And we also have a, our forest team that's also doing those surveys. But the idea here is within those areas of dead forest and live forest, can we see these changes, wet season, dry season, in the case for South Florida, um, in terms of CO2, methane, and then export within the, the estuarine system as well. So this project is led by uh, Ben Poulter and with co-eyes, uh, myself and a few others um, uh, on the team. And so what I wanted to show is this is some of the data that came in from March. This is from our flying flux tower. Um, and so we are measuring both CO2 and methane. Um, we just collected some more. It will take us a little time to actually show that. Um, but what we're able to actually do here is provide that spatial variability in methane that our flux towers, those four or five that are across the Everglades that they can pick up. And so what we're really getting is that spatial variability that we will link back um, to those land cover and land use changes and that satellite data. So I wanna end here with, I showed a lot of that wet carbon research, some key recommendations that came out of that paper. Um, the main thing being coordination across these carbon monitoring ecosystems, right? And we're talking about that today, right? How that land and ocean continuum work together. Um, really identify these fine uh, phase temporal effects, right? If we individual um, extreme events, at least from a satellite perspective, getting access to long-term archives. One of the reasons why we're working in the Everglades and their, their LTER site and really getting at what we're talking about today is this impact of disturbance and recovery and what that means for carbon uh, exchanges at that coastal system. And with that, thank you. Thanks, David. We have uh, a couple of minutes for questions for David, and then we'll have our panel for David and Greg. So, question for questions for David? Yeah, great talk. Um, Joey Crosswell from CSIRO. Thanks, Senator Brisbane. Um, I have a great technical question um, for maybe the more uh, big picture questions um, the discussion. For your um, flying and conveyance system, how? So, you showed a picture that kind of showed. Snapshot, um, but how long did it take to do those tiny reconcile uh, the temporal variability over, you know, alongside the spatial variability? Um, like that. Um, so these again were back in, in March. I think uh, all of these lines are collected within a matter of a week, um, and they're all flying about the same time. They got to wait for the boundary layer, so we're flying about nine a.m. And then they fly till about noon, maybe a little afternoon. Um, but again, all this is collected within a matter of a, a week. And that overlaps with the field crew and what they're doing out there as well. So they the same, same window in the dial cycle. As close as we can, right? There's a little shift in that. But yeah, definitely as close as we can. Yeah. Hey there, Joel Scott, as the headquarters. Thank you for the talk. Um, I really like that you touched on human impacts to these ecosystems. I was wondering if you could say anything, especially with your CMS project, like how you're taking your findings and making that actionable for stakeholders and decision makers, particularly in light of uh, creating more resilient ecosystems that um, can have mitigation and adaptation strategies. Yes, yeah, so definitely a good point there. I think one of the things, you know, as you know, too, is for CMS, it is connection with stakeholders. Um, and so in the case of this project in particular, uh, we were working with Everglades National Park, the Everglades Foundation, um, to really understand their needs in terms of that carbon monitoring. Um, so in the case of the Everglades Foundation, they are looking at or toward carbon credits. Um, and so kind of bringing that information to them to think about restoration strategies, um, as well as we just collected you know, we were flying um, the eddy uh, covariance system now, seeing definitely a lot more methane. Um, 
whether that's kind of offset from those CO2, we're not quite sure yet, um, but thinking about restoration across the region. So in this case, we are working hand in hand with park managers um, and the foundation to kind of um, pass this information off to them. It's not just us doing it for science, but it's also kind of linking this to what they're doing. And as well as we are scaling this, we can't fly that system everywhere, but we are working with folks in the Caribbean to be able to extrapolate the models that we're doing for, uh, for South Florida into other parts of the Caribbean. And this is my question to you. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about animals, so far of animals is lost. Um, within the different species of animals, and which species is more vulnerable? Is there anything like that? So I didn't, yeah, that's a good question. I didn't get too much into it, um, but what we did pull from was uh, the Everglades National Park did their recent vegetation survey. And one of the things that stood out um, was that of that die off that we measured, um, about 70-ish percent of that was, was one species, the Abyssinia, um, so black mangrove species. Um, I was just kind of add to that, one of the surprising things about that was that they are tending to be the most resilient to storms. Um, but in this case, uh, we did not see that. And so um, I think kind of Greg mentioned it as well, but I didn't show too much of that because of the time, but there is some drought effects that we're actually seeing. So 2015, 2016, and 2017 for the Caribbean were some of the most extreme drought that we've seen in the past 60 years. And what we're hypothesizing is that that drought combined with that storm, Hurricane Irma and Maria, um, really caused this sort of shift, um, or, or sorry, I should say like a heavy impact to Abyssinia, which are less sort of drought resistant. So there's kind of these two disturbances happening together that impacted the one species. Hi, uh, this is Shreya from the University of Colorado. I was wondering whether you had any wells that you area to measure uh, total alkalinity or DIC fluxes to the ocean from groundwater in that region as part of your mass budget um, for carbon processing. So what we have and what we're collecting is poor water. Um, there are groundwater wells in the system, particularly along the, the main sort of Shark River. Um, though I don't think those measurements are being collected, but we are doing that for, for poor water. And along that entire transect, both in the dead, the dead stuff and the regenerating stuff, we are collecting poor water, um, both surface water, poor water, and then estuary water. Why don't we have a great joint here at the panel with David, and then we can ask more questions. Uh, so I'll start from the mangrove side of it. Um, what we're seeing in that ghost forest is a almost a rabbit. Um, and some of the places that we're seeing, we can't quite tie it to whether it was Irma or not. Um, but what we're seeing is at least 10 centimeters of soil loss. Um, we're seeing that um, from the trees themselves, where the soil should have been, where it is now. Um, and what we're collecting lasers elevation information out there, uh, but we are seeing a rapid loss in the material, just just a, a mush right now really out there, versus the stuff that's regenerating is still solid, there's still a lot of root matter uh, there that's kind of holding things together. So from the mangrove side of things, it's a complete loss of that set. Right, near complete loss. Not so far to a freshwater force. As the trees die, there's, with their SDTs, there's maybe a little bit of a, less of an increase in soil elevation, but it's small. But primarily what's happening is that with uh, tidal extension upstream, the ETM is also moving upstream. And so these sites are getting very large amounts of new sediment accretion that is offsetting any uh, superficial subsurface loss. We're including a lot of this carbon in our budgets, but really what we've been focusing on is deep sequestration. So deep time sequestration. So either a carbon 14 or purely lead dating, in which case it's still a combination of both, 
but they're very high risk. So, okay. Great, uh, Marcelo, I don't think you say great, great talk, both of you. Um, so to both of you, the, I wanted to ask about droughts. So, um, great, uh, yeah, Greg mentioned the droughts and, and those boys. And we see that here in North Carolina, but what we see is it seems to be droughts followed by hurricanes are the years where we see most of those boys formation. So I was wondering if you see that also in your sites uh, and also what effect that might have on one. For us, um, it's more just the drought signal. And part of that's probably the landscape position, but these are relatively hydrologically connected systems. And that once a tropical cyclone based salinization event hits, usually we get plenty of fresh water coming from upstream that then washes it out. Now, some of that does get trapped in the soils of these floodplains for a while before it washes out. But the chronic stress or mortality in this extreme can usually be gone pretty fast for us. So it's really landscape setting, I think, for us that's making it just the drought signal. And Marcelo, like you said, I mean, that's what at least we're, we think we're saying right now. Um, we are putting together, uh, about to be resubmitted on this, is the impact of that severe drought that we had in 2015. 16 and 17. Um, but what we're seeing is it's really impacting those more indoor basins, those things that are disconnected. The stuff that has that tidal influence, those seem to be bouncing back just as they would in any other hurricane. It's those spots that just didn't have access to that to fresh water flow. Water's probably just stagnating in a lot of those areas. But it was like, what we see is that once you punch is what knocked it out uh, within those areas. I'll ask a question, Chris Oster, NC State University. So uh, this is to Greg as well. Uh, I'm wondering about this point you made about legacy sediments and land use change within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, and if I understand right, you were showing that upstream is where most of this uh, effect was occurring. And are you able to attribute that almost entirely to land use change and how these final freshwater swamps have formed? Or how can you break that out versus maybe uh, reference in unimpacted areas? It's a really interesting question. So, unfortunately, the Mid Atlantic doesn't really have any reference areas. It was all heavily impacted, pretty uniformly, actually. So you can't really use anything in the as a reference. Um, and it's not the original data, so it's not an experiment. So we just have to infer a process from what we can see and measure, in part based on landscape position. So there are differences across rivers. There's primarily the differences between near the head of tide and lower. And that's where we're finding more of a legacy sediment signature that closer to the head of tide, not too surprising, that's where most of the legacy sediment got trapped. And this had made it past the head of tide. Great right? famous work by me and others. 90% of the soil eroded never made it to tide. It's still trapped as legacy sediment, a non-tidal system, which is still being reworked to build. So it's our legacy sediment is not just what's there now, but also still coming. But mostly it was ahead of time. There's a great historical work of ports of how a lot of the colonial European port cities were um, had so much sedimentation that they could no longer get their ships up the stream. So there's some historical record too about where the rates of infill are highest once that legacy sediment get tied. And it's closest to the head of tide. So you can, it's not a uniform message, but it's always legacy sediment that form these systems. But what we're finding, and I, the message I tried to make was, even if the wetland was there before Europeans, um, it's still trapped more sediment than it had been before Europeans. And that elevation capital um, has been very important for right, forming the landscape we've seen over the past century, but should also inform predictions about how the system will respond to the rise acceleration. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Charlie from the University of Colorado. 
Uh, Greg, when you were talking about your sound organization events, I'm presuming you were talking about the above ground assuring. And if you were, I was wondering whether you'd also considered uh, saltwater intrusion in the subterranean estuary that may also, would you know, it'll take longer to flush that out, but may also trigger this transition to a ghost forest and then maybe eventually to mm -hmm. So when you conceptualize this, we mostly think of um, river surface water as the delivery of salt. Um, but we do have very superficial soil for water wells at our sites. And we do measure that once the salt gets there, we think through river or surface water, it does persist in the soils for a while. Um, but it depends on lots of things. Pumping um, long has been trying to develop a model of soil or water dynamics for these systems. So there is a meaningful um, storage of that fluid salt on the surface. We have not looked at deep subsurface groundwater, saline groundwater inputs. Um, but based upon the kind of hydrogeologic context of where these systems occur, fairly far, I, I'm kind of skeptical that there would be deep saline groundwater disturbing these sites, but uh, certainly the top meter of soil can store salt after it's delivered for a while. Um, Chris Osborne, NC State University. Uh, this is for David. So one of the things I was struck by in seeing your pictures of recovery of the mangrove after Herma is that um, it looked like there was some recovery. You can see some green amongst all of that. But in contrast to uh, what Greg was talking about, where once the canopy opened up, you have all this herbaceous come in. What are the differences there uh, in, in your system that you're not observing the same type of thing? Uh, well, I think the biggest difference is that there is no understory, that there's no transition to something else. Um, and so where I think the Atlantic region, right, you had this transition into the marsh or the salt marsh or whatever was coming in, we don't have that. So once the stuff sort of died, died in place, it's just losing those roots, losing it right away. So what we are seeing is the re-reading that's happening. So we've tagged some new trees out there. Um, what we're actually kind of a cool little thing is it's really the trees that kind of fell over, got out of the water table right now. Because it is kind of high flood water right now. But they're actually growing on the end of those roots that fell over. Um, so they're kind of out of that water table, um, which is kind of just a surprising thing that we didn't uh, didn't expect. Um, and so we kind of think it's these micro topography aspects that are now allowing for that regeneration. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick question? And Marcel or vice versa? Okay. Um, so I there's so John, I'm going to ask you about you. Um, one of the things that Chris's comment made me think about was um, just how big some of these coastal lakes are and that they like they kind of going on um, an analogy to Greg, right? like they probably weren't there hundreds of years ago. We don't really know, but this obviously this whole system has been transgressing. The cores go down. If you go down deep enough, you, you get um, seagrass cores. You know? So we all know that this has been transforming. And so how much of what you're seeing, this is a question for you, David. How much of the mortality are you seeing, do you think, is attributed to proximity to um, those coastal lagoons? I know it's ponding, but also, like, for example, had that, had Main Park Road not impounded from the back end the Flamingo Forests and there was hydrologic connectivity, would we see such mortality and la la lack of regrowth? Or, or recolonization? Well, I like that question, um, partly because, you know, we measured this 10,000 plus hectare area of loss. Um, much of that is most drastic, I think, right around a lot of the pictures that I'm showing. Um, that's maybe only one third of the larger dial that actually happened. 
a lot of it is happening away from at least recent-ish human impacts. Um, so I think it's just a natural part of how that system works. When you think about all of those lakes that are out there, I think it's just the evolution of what we're seeing for the Everglades. They are natural basins that are out there, 50 centimeter highs, but that's the mountain of the Everglades. Um, and so I think it's even those natural areas that we're seeing that happen as well. It just it's most drastic by the road because you get to see it every time you drive down. So um, this question is for Greg Marcella, I know again from NC State. So um, I, I know you've gotten this question and I've got it. Reporters love to ask. So so from a carbon perspective, is the creation of Gulf Forge a good thing or a bad thing? What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> so for, for more specifically, what if all of those forests were to turn into marshes, how long would it take those marshes to sequester the amount of carbon that's in the biomass? So we're using space for time substitution. So it's tough to exactly nail down that time scale for replacement of function, but we think it's on the order of years. We think it's very fast. But again, these systems, it's it's wetland to wetland transition. It's not lateral migration of marsh into adjacent uplands that do not already have wetland soils. This is one type of wetland for another type of wetland. Yes, it's changing forest marsh, but um, herbaceous plants, including those that have some tolerance to low level salinity, look at human conditions. In these type of freshwater forests are already in the universe or they're very sparse because of canopy closure. So as the system gets stressed, as the canopy opens up, they're already there to prime to take off and they grow fast, they have high uh, NEP, um, particularly below ground. And so it's a pretty fast transition. And the one site I emphasize on the Savannah River, we've got that 75% mortality in about three years. Um, that understory just visually going out there over time rapidly filled in so thick you could hardly walk there. So I, I do think it's on the order of years, not decades. But these are, this is, we call this longitudinal tidal extension upriver. Lateral and adjacent up ones, it's a very different story, but I do think that the literature for uh, carbon sequestration and the development of other ecosystem functions and created mitigation wetlands, both non-tidal and tidal, can be really useful for informing expectations about how fast these systems would recover or begin to accumulate meaningful amounts of carbon. And every wetland is different, of course, but you know, it's generally decades for most created mitigation wetlands to really develop meaningful sort of equivalent rates compared to natural wetlands or reference conditions. So it depends on what the diversion is for wetland and wetland is really fast. Hi, Dana from Duke University. So I had a question about methanogen. So I'm a microbiologist, don't do anaerobic research, but methanogens can only use fairly labile organic or they need a hydrogen source. So where is this labile organic carbon coming from? Do you expect, I mean, it sounded like you had at least some people that you had some expectations about methanogen as it is occurring in these systems. <laughs> The first and not, not last. <laughs> um, not my area of expertise, but right, everyone needs to know something about that thing. So I know a little bit which can be dangerous. But um, I did expect that there'd be higher rates in these tougher freshwater forests than we have measured. And I think the reason we're not getting that higher rates compared to a cobalt salinity level is a combination of the organic matter of the building. Um, you know, the production of wood is probably not that tasty for the methanogens. Um, but also, these are a um, little bit higher in tidal frame, and for half the day, at least or more, uh, is not anodated. And surely and definitely, as you go deeper into the sediments, it is. So, we think there's probably methanotrophy at the surface. 
campus, which is eating a lot of the keeper production. Um, but we don't really know. That's a guess. I can't say much on this. Uh, <laughs> I'm not being uh, a chemist on this project. Um, I just repeat what a lot of those folks say. Um, but I will say that they are measuring the folks that are on the ground. Um, I mean, they're measuring methane coming out of the tree, out of the metaphors, out of the soil, out of the water. Um, so something is there that's making a pretty strong signal um, that we're also capturing uh, with the, the, uh, the airplane as well. John, I'm coming up here. I, I have a question about how are either of you measuring sulfide? Um, sediment or water sulfide. Um, so we actually, this last week, we just collected, um, so we are doing H2S going forward on that. Um, so we collected it in four water in both the regeneration sites and the ghost forest sites. Uh, Blake Clark from NASA Goddard. Um, can you guys comment a little bit on the lateral export of carbon from your system, your system and if like conversion to ghost forest affects the lateral export down into the estuary or the uh, ocean? <laughs> One of the reasons we created our carbon budget for our study was to at least by mass balance to first cut estimate the lateral export of carbon from Squam into River Channel, which then for some goes downstream further, down right in further. Um, our budgets indicate that that carbon lateral production rate increases with salinization. Um, so again, space for time. How can decouple all processes, but it looks like eventually, once it does convert, um, there's more lateral. Uh, Load, load, load. To follow up on that, do you also um, have you constructed these mass budgets for phosphorus and nitrogen? Because I remember you threw up a slide that showed that when you transition from a ghost forest to a marsh, you also increase the reactive nitrogen and phosphorus pools. But then you also, I think, double the accretion rate doubled the organic carbon burial rate, but how did that impact the delivery of phosphorus or nitrogen to the estuary that could form a dissolved in a dissolved form or um, an increase in the reactive phosphorus or oh. nitrogen portion of your estimate? I'm getting my passion, but unfortunately for that study, you didn't do it. Um, I, I often try to couple everything with nitrogen phosphorus, but we just didn't have the resources to do it for that study of these tidal swamps. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could get more. Other questions? Let's thank our speakers at this point. All right, everyone, we're going to get started here uh, with our rapid fire uh, report out. And so, what we're going to do is just go uh, kind of round robin through our six groups, well, seven groups. So, let's go here from Saga uh, from the virtual breakout. So, again, top. You know, two between two and no more than five uh, points that you all had, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll go around the room and uh, and then have a just a, a quick discussion before we move on to the next group. So we'll start with group one, and Joey's going to give the report out. Do you have any questions? So a couple of the uh, interesting concepts that we learned uh, today were uh, post seven timeline. So. Um, comparison of different regions and impacts. One example that was given uh, was in New Zealand. You can see you know, where the Maoris came in and the, the impact of pre European colonization, but still human impact versus the uh, impact of European colonization. And then also um, just understanding how many coastal environmental settings they are, and that broad questions of how we define and prioritize these. 
and how extreme that's like the difference between, say, the Eastern US that we've heard a lot about and um, area systems or the diversity of systems in the city. Going from group to group, or are we going all the way down? Go, go through your top points. Uh, so for each question, yes. yes. Okay, so the second question, so critical missing piece. Um, I do want to quickly point out, I've had a diverse group and uh, with, with people from different uh, settings around the world and also got different expertise. And so uh, we found out we needed to find questions a lot, a bit more. Um, so we let it, instead of keeping things too constrained, we let things kind of diverge a bit because I think that's important as well. Um, so we found that we need to clarify what the what CSAW means, and also define what extreme events are in this context, because there was a bit of, of different interpretations uh, among our group. Um, a few things that we identified as key um, missing pieces are uh, uh, microbial omics and responses to pulses, um, what the baselines are on counterfactuals, like we've heard a bit about today. Um, we found ourselves to have talking for a bit about socio socioeconomic impact values and resilience. So, why does the trying to measure matter and where do we focus that um, based on its outputs? Um, during event fluxes, uh, so how those affect the by storming characteristics, storm and fire characteristics, how those translate to carbon shifts, depositional endpoints on relevant scales, climate change, and um, other by Sorry, I guess I, I wasn't. I was so apologize for that. I, I can see what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not going to have time. You guys are doing two things from each group. Yeah. Okay. We did it. an hour and a half minutes surprisingly fast. It did. So, yes. Uh, okay. So we'll skip to the next one and I'll pick two from what we have for each one. From each, like your group one. So you get three things to share. Then we go to group two and they get three. <laughs> okay. Nice. Good job. This is great. I've been talking all of the things that we had. Yes. Okay. So this gets back to our clarifying what a few things mean. So clarifying what a few things are. Yes. You should have stopped right there. That's okay. It was very good. Okay. So that's the best or what most number one. Okay. Perfect. Number two. We're group two. Uh, I think our group is a little more tightly connected. A lot of us are, a lot of people in this group are modelers or people in that space. And so our conversation tended to kind of focus on modeling. And I think the big thing that came out of it was that maybe modeling needs to go back to being more about theory and less about creating something that's extremely accurate, but for somewhere that's very small and kind of parameterized because it makes it very challenging to actually integrate models at different scales also compare models that are in similar regions. Uh, so that's something that we felt like needs to really be focused on. And then we also talk quite a bit about the cool technologies that help you to integrate across scales, but also give new insights in places where we're already doing problems. And then finally, temporal and spatial scales are both very important. That kind of gets back to that modeling element of um, whether we care more about getting things right spatially and having very high resolution stuff or would be careful about temporal things where it's high casting or projecting the temperature. So that's kind of where the station centered the most of the hour and a half. Thank you. Good. So the next three three. Thanks. What were the instructions, Chris? I don't know. <laughs> you know we just uh our top three we decided as a group was that um, one of the things we felt was important the baseline really is something that needs to be defined. We've been talking about extreme events, but what's the baseline? When you start monitoring or you know, odd years, whatever, non-event years, that's one of the things. Our second point was um, what technologies coming moving forward, satellites, et cetera, do the different communities have for observational needs. I think some of that will be discussed by one of the speakers tomorrow with Glimmer. Um, and then uh, we were really fascinated by the whole idea of the time scale of atmospheric transport versus hydrologic transport. We're really talking about things that are very, 
different kind of skills, but it's important to keep both of those in mind as a community of people who are spreading studying extreme events. So um, given that the two are can be quite variable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our group found that we are all a bunch of people from very different disciplines and we all are working towards the same goal and we're trying to get the same thing done but because of the lack of communication that sometimes occurs between the disciplines there are some things that we don't understand we think it would be helpful to develop similar methodologies units ideas in order to establish a baseline like group three talked about we said establishing a baseline for modelers especially would be really helpful in helping us to determine what normal variability is because classifying something as an extreme event is kind of a variable idea. It's not always set in stone. Um, and we talked about uh, knowledge silos and how we're all because we're all working towards the same thing. We're trying to do it separately and we are all working for the same goals. So we need to do it together, which is exactly what this workshop is. So it will be really useful to see the final result. Thank Thanks, yeah. So we actually weren't certain necessarily if we were all um, having the same goals. And so we wanted to um, coordinate, make sure that we were coordinated and, and among agencies and, and um, leveraging what existing research infrastructure for data collection there exists um, globally and nationally, et cetera. Um, the other theme that we addressed was um, Training to understand compound events, their interactions, their legacies, to really understand and attribute um, the responses that are highly variable uh, to extreme events in Seesaw. And then, sort of, get several examples of how we might do that. But then, the last thing was that we really felt like we can't do this alone and we can't do this in reactionary ways. And so, really, a call to interagency funding models for adequate capturing disturbances and coordinating research and sample networks. Okay. Um, so we, there's a lot of shared themes here, um, and we spent a lot of time discussing, well, first of all, the challenges of sampling events. So I think we, uh, many of us can understand those uh, challenges. But um, we also were talking about leveraging existing infrastructure, so kind of reaching out to these long-term ecological research sites or other long-term monitoring efforts and seeing if we could either piggyback or add to the existing payloads that are there um, rather than starting from scratch. But we also thought that it would be useful for sampling um, these kind of unpredictable events to have maybe a, a home site, we were calling a home site, that, um, that has a high event likelihood. So we discussed actually North Carolina a lot as being a place that will continue to be inundated with these events. And um, so you could, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a good home site that has a long history, but we can also continue to learn from this location. But then also um, having the opportunity to deploy um, sampling at maybe satellite locations. So kind of being a bit more agile in sampling um, these events in a safe and sustainable way. And also we touched upon uh, focusing on areas, coastal areas, bring in a lot of, um, bring in a lot to the economy. So it makes sense to focus there. Um, let's see. We also discussed, um, we're kind of discussing a lot about the organic geochemistry of the carbon that's being exported. And so 
It's uh, residence time really matters. I think that kind of taps into the both spatial and temporal variability, but also like how long your stuff sitting there is really going to dictate what it looks like and where it ends up. Um, and so that kind of relates to not just how much material is being exported, but um, what is its composition and its livability. So um, that's all going to vary um, on various uh, spatial and temporal scales too. So hopefully captured it. Really well. <laughs> Uh, just two key points. Again, getting back to um, what we mentioned, uh, that there are many coastal environmental settings. Um, we need to define uh, what these are and how to prioritize them. So it's four points. And again, our second um, is I think we still have a long way to go to understanding the pulse and press uh, concept. So uh, putting that in the, in the CSOC context is that the seesaw can tip one way very fast, like was shown in the video, it may take much more uh, time to recover and slow rate. So that's a time domain component. But that's also on a shorter kind of time scale. So that's we need to understand those at the event and annual time scale study. But we also might look um, in a more global seesaw context over long or decadal decay time scales. Um, for example, that would be ENSO type events where you have uh, one component that's a seesaw, one area of the world. And uh, a reciprocal or um, closing response in a different model. Great, thanks. All right, gentlemen, so here we are. Uh, we have some notes that were collated from the virtual session, uh, and those will be part of what you all have contributed. So, the Jamboard, the information with the Jamboard, the Google documents, that's going to funnel into uh, some of our products here. So. Even though we didn't touch on everything, uh, very good work. And I'm um, hearing a lot of common themes. And I think we've made a lot of progress today. So give yourselves a round of applause for day one. We'll wrap up for today. Uh, the bus will take you back to the hotel. And you can just get to it by walking back down the hallway and down the stairs out to the roundabout. Um, if there's a walking party, uh, that's fine too. What we're going to do for dinner is we will all uh, reconvene at the Morgan Street Food Hall, which is about two blocks from the hotel at 6.30. And it's a, a food hall. It's like a, if you're not familiar with a food hall, it's a big food court, better stuff than a food court at the hall. And, uh, you know, it's just a very social place. And so we'll look forward to seeing you all there and relax a little bit and continue the conversations. Tomorrow, we'll do the same thing. We'll have uh, the breakfast going in um, uh, Piedmont. That's where our food will be. And we'll be back in the mountains this fall right for day two. Well, thanks, everyone. And we will see you uh, at the food hall at 6.30.